All right, good evening. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I am Marita Gilbert. I am Associate Dean for Diversity and Campus Inclusion at MSU's College of Osteopathic Medicine. I'm so glad to welcome you all, um, both <laughs> those of you all who are here in person and then those joining us virtually on Zoom. Um, good evening to you all. I didn't get a chance to give you a greeting in the chat, but good evening, thank you for being with us. This is the second film in our health equity film series. So this is a collaboration between the Henry Ford MSU DEIJ um, subcommittee and the College of Nursing. And we're really excited that you all could join us. Um, we had great response in our first film. And so the second film, we're excited again to have some dialogue with all of our participants, right? Some interprofessional dialogue um, and certainly intergenerational. So some of us are students, faculty, staff, clinical um, administrators, right? So we're really excited about this opportunity. I have a couple announcements that I need to make and some information to go through before we kick off our film. So I'll do that briefly. Um, I want to thank in their absence, uh, so first I want to thank my friend and colleague, Dr. Krista Walker in the College of Nursing. She couldn't be with us this evening because she had to be at a conference, so she's working um, somewhere else, but I just wanted to make sure that we thank her for all of her um, contributions and her work to get this done. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Terry Grebe from the Henry Ford MSU Partnership um, for her support um, of all of our work around DEIJ. Um, so uh, this event provides both CNE and CME credits. You must complete the post survey to, re to receive any of those CE credits, right? So there will be some details that are gonna be explained to you in a moment. Virtual guests, if you are joining us virtually, you will receive a link in the chat to view the film um, and screen the film um, individually, right? So we won't be able to stream that due to copyright, but you will receive the link so that you can view the film as we're viewing it. All right. Um, so when you receive that chat, as we start the film, there'll be a countdown clock that'll be displayed on your Zoom screen. And at the end of the film, our virtual guests will be able to rejoin us. And we will have uh, what I'm so excited about, a talk back and discussion with Dr. Renee Kennedy of MPHI. So with that said, I would love to invite Adrian Wilkerson um, to come and explain the CME and CNE credits to you all. Hi everyone, my name is Adrian Wilkerson and I am an assistant professor and nurse planner here at the College of Nursing, working in the professional development and continuing education department. Um, I'd like to extend my welcome to you all as well. Thank you so much for attending tonight. So tonight's activity, um, as Dr. Gilbert said, does provide continuing education contact hour for nurses provided by our department, which is accredited um, through ANCC's Commission on Accreditation. Contact hours for CME credits are also made available by MSU's College of Osteopathic Medicine. So to achieve your CE credits tonight, you must complete a few steps. The first step is registering for the event. So if anyone has joined us last minute online or in the room, um, please reach out to one of us so we can get you that registration link so that you can complete that part. Next, we'll be viewing the film, as she said, in person, and you'll get the link through Zoom to watch it online independently as well. And then finally, we'll need you to participate in that guided discussion portion and complete the post-session evaluation. For those who have viewed the film, you will need to attest to this when you complete your evaluation. When you do that, you'll receive a certificate for two contact hours. It is possible also to receive partial credit if you were unable to view the film for any reason. You would also attest to this in that evaluation, and then you'll receive a certificate for one contact hour. Your certificate will automatically be sent to the email that you provide in that evaluation. So keep that in mind when you give the e that email address that it's one that will not block that incoming message with potential firewalls. So the certificate will have contact hours for both the CNE and the CME on it together. Um, just note that if you do need CME, that you scroll down past the certificate portion in that email and you'll have to follow some further instructions from the College of Osteopathic Medicine on claiming that CE. 
within their system. Um, also, just note that, that there is language on the certificate that denotes the state of Michigan implicit bias CE content requirements have been met by this educational activity. So we ask that everyone complete that evaluation tonight, immediately following the event, if at all possible. Um, that is when the information is just most fresh in your mind, and it also just helps us to facilitate um, activity processing a little more quickly on our end. We understand that this isn't always possible for everybody as you're navigating your evening, so it will remain open for a few more days, just so you know. And then for anyone not requiring contact hours, we would still ask that you consider completing the evaluation um, just to help us with future planning and um, evaluating this event. And then finally, as we head into the next um, part of the, the evening, I'd just like to remind everybody that the learning outcome is our goal for your education tonight. So we hope that by the end of the event that you'll be able to identify increased knowledge and state an example of historical factors and mitigation strategies that influence bias and health inequity in modern day healthcare settings. And with that, I will hand it back to you. Thank you guys. Okay, so we're here this evening. We're going to watch a film titled The Deadliest Disease in America. And it's a brief film, but I think it really um, encourages us to really do some reflection, to think about some of our experiences, how similar they may be, how some may be disparate, right? And to have us think about what it is that we can do. All right, so that'll be our film that we'll see in just a moment. I'm pausing here because those of you who are joining us online, I wanna give you this second to click the link that is in the chat. So as I introduce our speaker, that'll give you some time to pull up the link to the film so that you can watch it as we're watching and then rejoin us for some talk back and discussion. All right, so here's your chance to click the link in the chat. I'm going to read the introduction of our speaker. I'm really excited um, that we are joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Renee Branch Kennedy. I'm excited for a lot of reasons. Um, she just personifies excellence, and I'm excited for you all to hear from her, um, certainly as we have some reflection and some time to really talk back, right, after we watch the film and think about kind of what is our, what's our role, but also what are our responsibilities. So Dr. Renee Branch Kennedy serves as the Chief Executive Officer of MPHI, a unique public trust dedicated to advancing population health through public health innovation and collaboration. Prior to joining MPHI in 2014, Dr. Kennedy served as Health Officer and Director of Ingham County Health Department, located in Lansing, Michigan. Dr. Kennedy has held faculty and administrative positions. I'm hoping I can coax her to join me. <laughs> She's held faculty and administrative positions within the CS Mott Department of Public Health and the College of um, Human Medicine and the College of Nursing at Michigan State University, where she developed a research trajectory in health inequities. She continues to serve as an assistant professor chairing the core course health equity for public health practitioners. So after we conclude the, the film, the next voice you will hear is Dr. Renee Kennedy. So those of you joining us online, I'm gonna just bid you a quick farewell. You'll see um, a countdown come up on your screen in a few moments, and then we're gonna watch the film here in the room and then rejoin you as the film concludes. Thank you. Okay, you got your sleeves rolled up. Are we ready? Uh, your mark is set, think and feel. Thank you all for having me as part of such an important dialogue. Uh, this is literally my life's work. That seems so strange to be able to say this. It's work that um, I didn't necessarily seek out. It sort of found me and lassoed me in terms of my life events and my academic training and my professional responsibilities. And I just hope by the end of this, that you're gonna feel agitated enough that you can no longer sit on your hands or sit on your laurels if that's what you've done. So I'm a quote person and I love quotes. Let me just open with a context quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. You saw one from him already and given that we're at the tail end of Black History Month, uh, it seems appropriate. But Dr. King said, I have the audacity. I'm about to get a t-shirt that says, 
audacity. I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds and dignity, equality and freedom for their spirits. Is that too much to ask? You know, if you think about um, what we just watched in this video, I, I want us all to have the audacity. We're not asking for people to have, you know, a million dollar salary and live in gilded uh, homes. We're just asking for some fundamental, dare I say, Maslow's uh, for the psychologists in the room, just some fundamental, how can I survive in this world? And so I want to do two things. I want us, I want to guide us through a, a facilitated dialogue, but I also want this to be a dual, like learning for you so that you can then go guide someone else in a dialogue. So in our work, um, that we initiated at the Ingham County Health Department when I was the director there. And now the model that we use at um, MPHI is uh, facilitated dialogue as a methodology. So I'm gonna just show you uh, what that looks like. It's sort of a four part uh, step that we do. So it's called uh, an ORID or an IRID um, where you have information or objective content, like something that you're gonna be responding to. It might be a news uh, story. It might be something you just watched on Fox or CNN. Don't out yourself. We're not gonna make any political judgments. Um, and then how do you reflect on that? What's your interpretation of that? And then decisional, like what are we gonna do about it? And so you all experienced the informational objective piece because I want you to just see that informationally, we're talking about data. All of you, we're sitting in the, in the heart of a in university, a Big Ten research intensive university. So yes, we want data. We want all of our senses to be engaged, uh, but we also want to invite feelings. Uh, and your own lived experience, not just what you do at work, but also what you've experienced at home or in Myers or at your synagogue or wherever you find yourself living your life. Um, and then what meaning are you ascribing to that? What insights are you learning? And then what are you going to do about it? What are the actions and the strategies? So we tend to draft what we call a focus question. Here's the focus question I want to throw out for you just to be settling. And the focus question is usually like a suck air, like, I, I don't know. So I would offer to you the focus question following this video, this objective content that you've gotten is, what would our work as clinical leaders, what would it look like if the field of healthcare applied health equity strategies to transform the systems that create health inequities? That whole movie was about people living the consequences of systems that were creating health inequities. And so our responsibility, because all of these are man-made, socially constructed, people determined, our job is to figure out how to transform that for the next generation. And we wanna be at that reflective stage having seen the video. So let me just ask you, of all the things you saw in that video, what stands out for you? What nugget is like sitting on your heart or a craw in your side? What stands out to you as either surprising, important, unexpected? Okay, so um, for me, I guess it was the boys, the little and it was the same doctor and two different um, variations of treatment. Which, which, which little boy? Which? It, okay, it was a um, Caucasian boy and a black boy. I just want to make sure we're all following each other. So, um, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to still unpack that a little bit more. Uh, say more. You described, you gave us information, but we're in the reflective space. So what's the why behind that? 
Um, because I have a son here and um, he doesn't like talking to doctors. So sometimes he won't get the right answer um, depending on um, what doctor I see, for example. So what feelings land for you with that? Um, it's just sad. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel a lot of empathy because, you know, I've been there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for letting me stretch you a little bit. What else? What stands out as um, surprising, important? We have some comments online. So um, one of the first things that stuck out was about the social worker who didn't help out more. Um, someone else responded, how invisible people can be in healthcare. Um, this idea of not being listened to by the doctor when you know offering a history. Um, this one is particularly poignant. So we were given a timeline at two points in the film so that this keeps happening over and over through the years and decades. Um, someone else is surprised that we haven't made more progress by 2024. Um, and I would offer, like don't burst my bubble. We, I came into this room, onto this Zoom thinking we've made progress, but then you had the nerve to show me dates in 1990 and 2010 and right. whoa. Mm -hmm. Um, so this theme of disrespect um, has come up in different ways. Um, this, uh, one of the respondents talked about um, experimentation that still, ex that still exists, that's being carried out um, on people of color. Um, hmm. That someone can go to a professional school Right, for six to eight years. Um, they're considered an expert, right? But a person's lived experience is often ignored. We tend to focus on physicality and disease without thinking about the multi dimensional aspects of health. Yeah. We can have, which is why you can have two patients with the exact same diagnosis the exact same prognosis, give them the clinical plan of care, send them home, and they get completely different outcomes because the homes to which they go are completely different. The opportunity to actually live out and make healthy choices is completely different. And then what we often see is when they come back in, and it's like, well, I don't know why you, you know, I don't know why you're having problems because I have the same situation with this, right. and they, and they're doing great. <laughs> yeah, you know, you may not be articulating that clinically, but that's what's happening in people's minds. We problematize the person instead of the context and the environment. So there are two others, and I think we'll address these throughout our time. Um, one person wants to know how we address issues of racism when it happens, right? Um, knowing that emotions can take over, um, but silence kills. Now let me offer this. Our inclination in doing dialogue across difference about race is to jump to solution. Okay, can you just tell me what to do? Mm -mm. I'm gonna make you sit, I'm gonna make you sit in these feelings for a minute. So whoever wrote that, Pull back, pull yourself back and say, okay, but what causes me to say that? What are my feelings? Because we're also taught professionally that feelings are for the personal environment. And we're arguing, no, this is head, this is heart, and this is hands. What are we going to do? So tie that comment to some feelings. Was there one more? Um, it's kind of the same, right? Mm -hmm. really, really wanting us to address accountability. But mm -hmm. I feel like that's after we talk through some things. Yeah. I, I do appreciate and I, I tend to give some grace around the jump to let's do something because I feel some urgency. I, I definitely feel some urgency. A couple more comments in the room. Alrighty, uh, I think it was already mentioned on the Zoom. Someone made a comment about this particular um, surprise that we saw in the video. But what became surprising to me was the timeline. Mm. 
every decade, it was something new um, that was occurring. But unfortunately, on the healthcare end, there was no changes. You know, and you had the 1960s, there's the civil rights movement, and you're thinking we're fighting for equal rights. And there's other changes that have occurred since then, right? And let's even throw in the Affordable Care Act, as people love to throw around in Obamacare. But it's the Affordable Care Act. And you would think all those things has occurred, that there would be an improvement in the treatment of people of color or people who are like those two young boys at the end of the video, living with disabilities to have the same equal treatment, but it wasn't. It's like we've come so far, but healthcare seemed like it has stayed the same. I think even at one point in the beginning of the video, they mentioned that it takes for some people 60 miles to get to the next healthcare center. It's like, I wonder how long has it been that way? And has anyone ever addressed that? And it just seems like healthcare isn't changing but we are changing. So when are we going to catch up? And that was like the most thing I was surprised about. Yeah, thank you. I, I will um, ditto and co-sign that. That timeline is brutal. <laughs> it is just brutal. Please say it. It isn't so. Yeah, it, it is so. Um, I would like to touch on uh, fear in the film, right? So especially when it came to black men's health. So my grandfather is from Mississippi, right? He did not start going to the doctor until we really forced him. And by then he was getting diagnosed with, you know, heart failure and all these different things. But he has such a major distrust of the system and also being Southern. So this notion of fear is what I noticed most in the film. Even I have fear and I was saying this in our discussion group of picking the wrong doctor, or you see all the experiments that were done on enslaved black women and their reproductive health. So as someone in their 20s, I'm scared to have children because I'm afraid you're not going to listen to me when it comes to my reproductive health. So that notion of fear, oh, yep, see, someone even mentioned it, that mistreatment of women. Um, so it's hard to get past that. And like they're like, go get black doctors. Where? How do I find them? Where are the resources? What's really going to push us so we can find those solutions and sit in those feelings and <laughs> talk to them about our needs? So that's something that stuck out to me. Yeah, that, that is powerful. And sometimes we don't want to call it fear. But it is. It is like, mm, what if? Uh, I have three adult sons, and I, I literally, as long as they were under my roof, spent years trying to find a black male physician for them. And uh, we happened to, I was part of an organization that did a community fair a couple of weeks ago on uh, kidney disease, particularly in the black community. And oh my goodness, there were two black men on the panel of two black men physicians. I went running up like, are you taking patients? Because, I mean, they're 28 now, but would you take my son? Uh, and uh, he did give me my card, but then it occurred, oh my gosh, what if they don't take his insurance? Because, uh, yeah, the rules, all of the barriers, right? All of the things that get in the way of just do what you need to do. So thank you. Thank you for calling out fear. I think um, two notes that I made watching the film were people's responses. So on the one hand, in the focus group, um, when you saw the participants being asked, right, if they could name mistreatment or racism in their treatment, right? Now, in my experience, the way I received that was there were some people looking around like, now am I gonna name that in mixed company? Right? There was a real hesitance around really naming that thing. That's the first thing. The second is also an emotion, but if you remember um, the focus group participant who had gout and his response was anger, right? The anger. Um, and because you are a colleague of mine, you, you and I have talked and you've written about 
really purposeful anger, right? So not just I'm angry because I'm being mistreated, I'm angry because it's hard for me to name this thing that's happening, but also how that can be a fuel or how it can be purposeful so that we can um, get to our better, right? But I was really struck by his anger, right? Like I'm, I'm, forced, um, I'm forced to address this thing and anger was the first thing, which again, could have been underlying fear. Right. Right. Man, I don't know about the rest of y'all, but watching his anger. And, and you know, Dr. Jones, Kamar Jones talked about um, internalized uh, racial oppression. And I found myself experiencing some internalized racial oppression because I was like, Ooh, they're gonna call you the black, angry black man. You gotta stand down. Uh oh, they're gonna call the police. Don't, don't, don't. I'm like, breathe, breathe. This is how this stuff literally gets inside of our bodies. And it's like, okay. And I don't know if, I don't know if these were actual, like the cl clinical interactions. I don't know, are they staged? Are these actors? Or are these real? But yeah, it, it was very, um, hard to watch his anger. Legitimate, his anger is legitimate. He's like, I just have gout. Can, right. some, can somebody help him? a big toe, not hurt? Yeah, yeah. hard, those, those are powerful. What else is coming up? Again, remember, we're still in the reflective feelings space of this video. Um, someone else mentioned the prevalence of racism in obstetrics. Um, and this person talks about their daughter-in-law being ignored um, after reporting her symptoms and that she lost her baby two days before the scheduled induction. Big trigger for me. Um, in, in 1989, um, I had the traumatizing experience of contributing to the infant mortality statistics. Uh, when my six-month-old died as a result of his prematurity. So hard, hard, real-life stuff, real-life stuff. It's almost, let me, flipping a bit, but the racism that is also from patients to providers of colors, having worked as a nurse in Sparrow, and I can tell you that nurses would come out and just be biting their lip but saying afterwards, you know, just that uh, the patient inside or the family doesn't want that black nurse or, you know, find me someone else or, you know, that doctor, why she have such a funny name? My father-in-law being as well, one like that. So um, I think just that awareness um, as well. And then I was just going to say, it just seems to me more of an argument also for universal health care. It doesn't solve racism, that's not, but at least in terms of more of a mandate to provide these things. And then, like I said, though, you got to go home, and then what's Maslow going to do in terms of, you know, where's your roof, where's your food, where's your love? So. Just well, hold, hold on to that one because okay. we're going to come back when we get to decisions. We're going to come back to that. Um, I love that. You know, we are all products of our environment. All of us, regardless of our skin color. We, many of us, if we didn't get raised in this milieu, this historical and contemporary milieu that has subtly at times and more directly at times taught us a hierarchy of human value. The men are better than the women, and the white folk are better than uh, the black and brown folk. And even within race, we internalize that. So fairer complexion, lighter complexion, blacks are more comfortable. I mean, I'm real clear that I'm like a palatable black woman because <laughs> I'm about the color of my suit today, I guess. <laughs> It's, it's not as threatening to people. Oh my goodness, how many times have I had white friends, colleagues say in the summer, oh, look at, I, where the, don't, let's don't, let's don't. But this issue of colorism, 
is also a concern. And as, as a overly probably educated black women, having these degrees and how we get valued because of being doctorally prepared as opposed to someone who is not doctorally prepared. We are experts at othering and categorizing and valuing. Um, I'm privileged to have been on faculty in the College of Nursing for 16 years as a medical sociologist. Who, who anyone from nursing today? Yes, I'm, I'm looking at faces. I'm like, I feel like they're familiar. My whole pet peeve while on faculty in the College of Nursing was being described as a non-nurse. I'm gonna need you to not describe me by what I'm not. Uh, I am a sociologist. You can call me a so. Oh, you know what we mean, Renee. Mm -hmm, I do know what you mean. So having to continue <laughs> to say the thing, but docs, y'all don't get off the hook because they say non-physician uh, all the time as well. I'm on the board of a of a health system, and we have some. JCO reports or whatever, these things we have to do, and they always say non-physician provider. Like, can we lead up? Can we? Well, that's what they require. Can we, every time we turn in the report to whatever national entity, say this language is problematic? Can we be the ones to just get on their nerves? That's how change happens. Um, I've been doing this work since 1989, and we weren't saying health disparities then. We weren't saying all the, 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 the language is gonna change, the words are gonna change, but the mission and the purpose has remained the same. Any more in the, yes. <laughs> Sitting down on your job. Um, I guess what, what strikes me and what I keep thinking about are the eyes of the people, every single person in there and I like I almost teared up I probably will I don't know if I'll get through this but um, like I'm a mom of six children and I love them and like the children in that picture and watching the dad stroke that young black boy's head like I love you I love you and then that white resident who was so dismissive Right, and in kind of abrupt, like the way that he touched those children. Who wouldn't, right? And like as, even though I'm not, I don't, if I stretch my neck, I'm five feet. But <laughs> I, I like will say something like, what? Like recently my mom um, died, not this January, but January 8th, a year ago. And I, as one of six, stayed and held her hand and sang and told stories, you know, while she was in hospice. And um, I saw her take her last breath. The doctor came in and said, time of death, 12 I don't even know what came after that. And then he said, right after that, will you take her jewelry off? We need this room. And I said to him, no. I said, one of the most special things we did was hold hands. I'm going to sit here and hold her hand. And then I said, I'm one of six, and we love our mom so much. I'm going to call every one of them one by one and tell them what just happened. Because they were local. They just didn't stay the night. And I think about my privilege. My dad was a physician. Right, and, and I watch that, and I can't even imagine, you know, what everybody else was um, experience, and experience daily. So I, I, why can't we see people? We all have the same beautiful eyes. Like I see you, right? Like there's something for me with a person's eyes, like when I look at their um, I, there's like a special connection and there's no difference mm -hmm. with the eyes, right? Humanity, yeah. right? The yeah. heart of humanity. Up That's with beautiful. the technology, totally down with the compassion. Mm. Like F minus <laughs> on the <laughs> compassion. Yeah, I think that um, the elevation of the, of the dad with his young son as he was rubbing his head 
I think that was another manifestation of anger too. He just was so controlled when he's like, uh, my son is autistic. He can communicate with sign language and I can translate for you. But more, you know, he wanted probably to be just like that big guy. Did you not hear me say my son is autistic? And but you, you, all of our ways for coping with those feelings. Uh, and tears are motivated by so many things. That's right. Joy, sadness, outrage. Yeah, thank you for that. So there are two that are um, a bit related. So um, I'll start with this one. One of the things that stood out to me was the woman who was gardening and took her son to the ER and didn't receive the level of care um, expected until she identified herself and her position. Um, and they talk about having experienced that as well. Um, and the fact that they don't typically disclose their healthcare background, but had to recently, um, when they took their own child to the ER with the same organization they work for, <laughs> because they did not feel like they were being heard as a parent. And then this kind of sums up that, that comment, really this idea that we need to continuously advocate for ourselves or our family members. Um, and this idea of not feeling safe enough to be vulnerable in a place that's supposed to take care of our health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's the Martin Luther King quote um, about, um, what is it, racism in healthcare is amongst the most inhumane. Like nobody's in this space unless they need some deeply vital service and yet we are products of our environment and we, uh, someone said, no matter where you go, there you are. Mm -hmm. And it's the same stuff regardless of where we are. <sighs> Cleansing breath. Let's think about this next step in the dialogue technique. So interpretation, what meaning are we going to bring and uh, you might not be able to see those that clearly, but there are several uh, questions. So let, let's just have the one up first so we don't get distracted by reading and by words. Um, so this need to have courage to talk about race in healthcare. I absolutely believe that dialogue is the technique, the strategy that's going to leverage. Not just idle conversation, not chatting, mm -hmm. but deep dialogue. And there is so much that gets in the way of our being able to have meaningful dialogue. So let's unpack that a little bit in terms of how we're interpreting what we saw in, in the video. Why is it so difficult to talk about and work to counter racism in healthcare? What gets in the way? I love that there's such deep, rich silence <laughs> at the question about why are we silent. <laughs> um, so um, a fear of repercussion. Sometimes our pride is what gets in the way. Defensiveness. So okay, let's, 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 let's go slowly. Okay. Repercussion. That is a tough, tough thing because our health systems are also hierarchies. Mm -hmm. And if you're a junior resident and you're not a senior resident, and if you're a senior resident and you're not the attending, or if you're the nursing student and you, man, saying the wrong thing or sometimes saying the right thing at the wrong time that's not an unreasonable hesitation. Repercussions are real. In, in public health, uh, as we were trying to agitate folk to do more, and they were like, you know, I, I think I would get fired, particularly health officers who are appointed by elected um, officials, commissioners. And, and uh, they say, you know, I, I think I would get fired. And I can name easily three of my friends, mm -hmm. professional friends, who lost their job because of speaking up and wrongdoing. 
I don't know if you all have been watching what's happening in Ottawa County, uh, but that health officer, Addie Hamlin, was about to be fired because she would not kowtow and she stood up for equity and for justice. Uh, but man, she, I don't know, she stood her ground and they have just, just yesterday decided that they would stop with the attempts to terminate her. Um, but we all need a paycheck. <laughs> we all have bills to pay. And that is a real risk. Repercussions is a real risk. So go back to the other, you listed a couple of other. So we talked about pride, um, defensiveness, right? Um, so a defensiveness around acknowledging racism or admitting the need for change and self-reflection. <laughs> Some people, um, this comes up often, this feeling that uh, you don't have the correct answers. Mm -hmm. We're going to go there, but then we're going to go back because I don't want to rush through these. Mm -hmm. I, wa I want us to really massage them because I want y'all walking out of here in a few minutes, <laughs> in time-ish, feeling like, no, I'm going to be courageous enough to say something. Mm -hmm. Practice on someone that you love tonight. <laughs> it's like it could be your trial run. Yes. Um, just even when you were talking about hierarchy and I, I was thinking, it is a very hierarchical system. It's a very caste-based system, healthcare is, um, within almost any aspect. The nurses, certainly the physician, you know, there are hierarchies, not just based upon how many years you've had in. But it's also, it's just a reflection of society. It's, you know, it's not like, oh, it's just only about healthcare. I mean, we all know the, the, the racism whether it's racism, economic, socioeconomic, religious, you know, it's, it's not like it's separate. Yeah. We, so. we like to say that we don't have a caste system in the United States. Pshaw. <laughs> we certainly do. Certainly do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Dr. Gilbert just reminded me of a really important piece, caste, from the beginning. Kende, right? Oops. Isabella Wilkerson. Oh, my God. I w you know what? I was going to say Isabella Wilkerson, and then my brain said, nope, you're wrong. So didn't you say something about fear of being wrong? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are a couple things. Well, we can slow walk through these. Um, so someone said the fear of being perceived as a troublemaker or being too sensitive. Um so I want to I want you to slow walk through this one, this idea of gaslighting. Mm -hmm. So we spend so much time trying to keep our composure uh, or to keep our jobs or our status or try to remain calm in the midst of psychological harm. Uh, I like to say that my superpower is relationship. I am deeply committed to relationship. My assistant is always like, will you stop telling people you go have coffee? You don't have coffee or lunch space until like 2027. Stop. <laughs> but that's where I build deep relationship, sitting at a table where there's room and space to be who you are. And I work on authentic relationship so that on those days when I just, I'm going to say the thing. Because I, it's going to make my brain explode if I don't say, I can't believe. Then you're going to learn. And I have found that people then become invested because they care deeply about Renee. And wow, if this is really damaging this person that I love and care about, and I say love even in the professional sense. We have deep relationships at work as well. Then they pause and they say, okay. I'm willing. So that whole not wanting to be the troublemaker, I usually am just transparent with my fears. You know what? I don't want to be cast as the troublemaker, but I just feel like I need to say this. Um, I often say, and people sometimes laugh at me, hear my heart. Can you hear my heart on this? Like, I'm not intellectualizing this. This is, can, I, can I just share my heart with you on that? Um, and people have a little more capacity to say, oh, wow, you're not actually trying to 
cause trouble. Yeah, you're really trying to push us to the next place. So one of, um, one of these speaks to um, the difficulty of acknowledging what's been done or what we have allowed um, or contributed to, which is why I think I, I go back to the opening of this film. So originally, so I had to watch it more than once, clearly, to be ready. Um, but originally, when I watched the film, I thought there was something wrong with the audio when it started, with the timeline. And what I realized the second time was it was in, on purpose that there was echo, mm -hmm. right? Because these, it wasn't just these finite points in history, so that it was echoing and then there was overlap, right? And so I think part of why it's so difficult is because many of us aren't ready or aren't willing to acknowledge what has happened. And I think even watching you all watch the film, I'll admit that, that I do that. Um, I watched you all look at those timelines and across most of your faces was like, a, what? We still doing this? Or it was in this part of the country and that part of it over here and up there and around there, right? So I, in some ways I think it is really powerful, those of us who are, um, you know, I'm in medical education or nursing education. It's powerful to make sure that our next generation knows more about the history, knows about what's been, what's been done, what has happened, and can understand why there are some people that may show up and not just be as open, understand um, deeply rooted or intergenerational distrust, right? And that it is, in fact, founded in something. Well, and all of those points, I think, feed into the point about gaslighting. Oh, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm so, I don't think she meant that. No, I think you're overreacting. Oh, no, they didn't say that. And, and you find yourself, maybe I did, miss, what? I thought for sure. Then you're second guessing yourself, then when you're second guessing yourself, you're more inclined to be silenced. When you're silent, dialogue doesn't happen. When dialogue doesn't happen, change doesn't happen. And it doesn't take a lot. Like I hope, um, I mean 70 people online is great and the number of people in, in the room is great. We tend to measure success with volume. So I want to um, discourage anyone from thinking, man, the whole room wasn't, it wasn't standing room only, it wasn't packed out. Mm -mm. I don't believe in coincidences. The people whose hearts and minds were set to hear this tonight are in the room or they're on this line. And it's not gonna take much for us to have a ripple effect, that echo mm -hmm. throughout our places of work and influence and um, our personal responsibilities. So we could do a whole session on gaslighting mm -hmm. because it is, I mean, some people that gaslight are strategically knowing that they're gaslighting. Um, I won't take us down a long discussion on CRT, but I remember when I <laughs> first saw the whole dialogue around critical race theory, and remember, I'm a sociologist. I'm like, wait, I'm a doctorally prepared sociologist. We didn't hardly touch base on this. I, oh, that, that was some lawyers. That was a lawyer theory. And I kept thinking, I feel like someone sat in a room and said, we got to think of a way to weaponize this. So I will say that the whole disruptive debate around CRT was brilliant. Someone sat in a room, and after doing much more research, I learned that it was a gentleman named Chris Rufo, Rufio, something like that, who said, oh, I came across this idea. We can actually use this against them. We can actually use this to advance our agenda, which is not the agenda that it was designed to advance, but hey, follow me. And here we wasted a ton of time on a point that now has us saying in some states of this country, we probably should stop talking about slavery. Actually, if you think about it, Gaslighting 101, uh -huh. wasn't slavery was kind of like job training for, for blacks, wasn't it? Gaslighting. Like they learned a lot out there picking cotton. Oh my word. 
People are actually having that conversation because that's not a dialogue. Right. Yeah, truly. So, so let's go to um, a lot. Clearly, you all are raising lots of points in the room and online about what's stopping us from talking about racism. Let's peep at the next question on that list. Also, Sakaya said, don't disrespect the online people. It's 85, not 70. <laughs> Come on now with the 85. <laughs> they are in here. They're, they're in here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, Kamara Jones, again, oh, you're talking about, uh, I did have a chance to um, meet, I think Dr. Jones is my best friend, but she doesn't know it. I'm a, uh, I did meet her and get a chance to uh, speak with her, and I said, you don't know this, but you are my mentor. So uh, <laughs> sometimes people mentor you in direct relationship, and sometimes they mentor you. Like, like <laughs> She's all up, all up in. <laughs> so Dr. Jones at this uh, Council for Black Health meeting that I was at said, there are many of us that have been giving platforms that we are not using. Mm. I need you to use up your platform. Speaking of having consequences and retribution, Dr. Jones is the poster child for it. She's lost jobs, she's lost grants, she's lost relationships, and the work was just bigger than that for her. That was the work, not being so afraid. But as a medical doctor, she also knew her worth, and she's like, okay, well, you kick me out of this club, I'm gonna go over to this club. She's been courageous, not without pain, not without fear. Uh, but in the video, she talks us through these different forms of racism. And if you've never read her article on The Gardener's Tale, she uses a lot of allegory in her work, which makes it so approachable. Like you could just really Google Dr. Kamar Joan allegories. She's got about four or five of them now. But she talks about these forms of racism. Why is it important for medical educators, nursing educators, clinicians, future providers to understand this interplay between levels of racism and how they're built on each other. So the way we simply describe uh, the levels is it uh, occurs at the personal level, which is me and what I think and what I know and what I feel. It's all the stuff inside. Once I express it, then it becomes interpersonal. I live my relationship and relationship with you in an institution. And an institution is inculcated or surrounded by a culture. The old culture where uh, nurses had to stand when physicians walked in the room. Odd behaviors like that, I am going to call that an odd behavior. My mom was a public health nurse, and if I had listened to her, I probably would be a nurse today, but you know how hard headed children can be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so cultures change. We are the culture bearers. You are the culture bearers. You determine what we value and our way of being in the institutions that right now are creating rules and regulations that disproportionately negatively impact people that are brown and that are black. And I would just offer this, that just because you have brown or black skin does not mean that you get it. And just because you have white skin does not mean that you don't get it. Some of my strongest allies are white friends and colleagues. I have one colleague who leads a lot of our internal anti-oppression work at MPHI. And he, as a white man, describes himself as someone who grew up black adjacent. I grew up in Detroit, going to a predominantly black school. All of my friends, most of my friends were of color. And he says his dad would sit him down regularly and say, now, you are not black. And I need you to understand that you have a different level of privilege in the society that you need to use to benefit your friends that you love. 
I also have a number of black and brown friends that will say to me, okay, don't bring up nothing about racism and justice today, Renee. We're not, we're not going to do that tonight. Y'all, no, do not bring it up. So this is about who you are and what is your mission and your purpose. We all have one. And sometimes it's not just like, I'm going to be a nurse. Well, what kind of nurse? What are you going to value? What's going to be the fuel that drives how you help people, how you lead, which is basically about helping people? So that question. We only did personal and interpersonal. We didn't do structural. and Yes. Okay. And we didn't do the, the many others. Interpersonal, personal, interpersonal, institutional, cultural, structural. All of these things get codified, and all of these things are changeable. All of them are malleable. So when people say, it's so hard, how are we going to ever change racism? How are we going to change poverty? Mm -hmm. Get on my Christian friends, because I also have religious privilege in this country, um, and way more religious privilege than my colleagues who are Muslim by faith. Uh, you know, that, well, the Bible says, the poor you will have with you always. Does it say the same poor, the same families, the same generations over and over again? So how are we going to use who we are, our strengths, our identities to be disruptive? Because all of this can change. All of it can change. So those are the levels. And that's where, um, let's go back to Dr. Jones's question. Um, how, uh, how do you see them? building on each other. Have, have you experienced one of the levels that was deeply contradictory to who you are personally? See if we can come up with an example in that space. Where did you just butt heads with one of the levels? Can you run back the mm -hmm. Again, the levels are the personal, the interpersonal, the institutional, the structural, and the cultural. As you're thinking, even something as simple of, wow, personally, I really, really, really believe this. I remember being in a biology lab and we were doing blood typing. And my partner happened to be a white woman classmate. And she said, what's your blood type? And I said, be positive. And she said, well, you must have did it wrong. And I said, actually, I knew I was B positive because my mother is O negative. And my dad is B positive. So me and all my brothers better be B positive. <laughs> and she got really agitated. And she was like, I'm just saying, I don't know about that, but you did something wrong. So agitated till the, the, um, our grad assistant came over. He's like, what's the problem? She says she's B positive. OK, why is that a problem? Well, she can't be B positive, this white student says to me, because I'm B positive. Literally, this college student did not think that black and white people could have the same blood type. Now, y'all look, it wasn't, I mean, I'm, it hadn't been ancient history since, it's been a long time since I've been in college, but it's not ancient history. And it blew her personal level paradigm out of the water. I don't think I've ever seen a white woman become more red. She was so, I don't know, angry, uh, embarrassed, humiliated. Like I could just, and, and now as I reflect on it and try to come with a space of grace and compassion, it's like somebody told her that, you know, White people are better, and we have our own blood type club, and all of the narratives that got fed to her, that got disrupted, bam, ran right into the reality in that interpersonal level. 
not long after I started working at the College of Osteopathic Medicine, I was in a meeting and I credit um, this physician for their vulnerability. But I remember them saying, yeah, even when I was in medical school, I was taught that black people have a higher pain threshold. Right? And so when you asked about the interplay between institutional kind of racism, right? And then how that then can be transformed into structural racism when you then go into practice, right? And then someone shows up and says, oh my God, I'm really, I'm really in pain. It's, you know, I remember when I was younger, it wasn't the faces, it was the numbers, the scale. Oh, it's at a 10 plus. And then someone says, well, surely that can't be because y'all don't feel pain like that, right? Or <clears throat> examples um, often of black women in particular who are carrying babies and show up and talk about their sy symptoms and are disbelieved, directly linked to James Marion Sims, right? And the legacy of his work is still, we're still paying the cost for that and it shows up institutionally and it shows up structurally, right? When we talk about um, black mama mortality, infant mortality, right? Like it is still showing up. So if you ask me about the interplay, that would be one of the, or two of the examples that I can think of top of mind, right? That still show up in 2024. I love that, yeah. Um, I like what you talked about, about allyship, right? So one of my doctors I had in the past, Maggie is white, but Maggie was my girl because she really sat down with me and would not put me on certain medicines or we would have deep discussions because she's like, well, this is going to affect you as a black woman and I need you to get checked for this because this shows up, this affects you or I've always had like acne, right? So she's like, well, I don't want to give you this because this will lighten your skin. So... I loved Maggie because she took the time to actually deliver patient care and she did her research. So she became one of my biggest allies and she was one of those people I didn't, I was kept getting told like go find a black doctor, but I'm like, I'm not leaving Maggie if she's doing all of this, like going above and beyond. So she has become one of those medical allies for me and I believe her and I trust her opinion. So I like what you talked about with that. It's not always someone that is your skin type. And <laughs> just because you are black doesn't mean you know everything or just because you're white doesn't mean you, you know anything less. You know, like she really showed up for me. So I like what you talked about with that. Yeah, that point about she took the time to do her research because a lot of this is not in the books. It's not being taught yet. And so there's that sort of continuous learning and um, a commitment to make sure you're providing the best care possible to all your patients and recognizing there might be some pieces that you're missing. They're thinking about the comment. Ooh, it must be a juicy one. We're going to clarify and come back. OK. Um, I also want to just offer that um, I, as of late, have been given some pause because we've just been so good at um, elevating the negative narrative around black and brown folk. Oh. They're three times as likely to die, and the babies are four times as likely. I mean, it's like so, it's such a negative narrative. And so I want to make sure that, that you're not hearing this as, you know, those poor black and brown folk. It's not about a deficiency, because if things were flipped and white people lived with the burden and history of oppression, it would be the same thing. And so just being careful, because I think that's what we've done in, the, in clinical context, is that we say, oh yeah, they're more likely to, um, they're less likely to experience pain. And 
have some statistic. Now, you all know, as a researcher, you know we can use stats to <laughs> make a lot of points. Um, and so being willing to say this is not about problematizing the people, it's about problematizing the processes and the systems that have predisposed people to the outcomes that we're measuring, right? We could measure something completely different. Uh, did you know that black women are more likely to excel in spite of X, Y, Z? We don't talk about that because it's seemingly not as salacious and not as interesting and it doesn't also reiterate the deficiency, the deficit model of the narrative. Let's see what the third question is up there. Ah, sweet Crystal. Uh, this term intersectionality is also coined by an attorney, uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw and David Bell, who's the early theorist, talks about how compounding things are. Actually, Arlene Geronimus at U of M talks a little bit about weathering, mm. which is the same thing. It's like this additive effect of one more thing. But if you are if you are living with a disability, that in and of itself is enough to bring a burden of, of disease and access. But if you are, have a disability and you are a person of color and you are a woman, all of these things are like, man, just. So I, I loved her comment about, you know, she was ready to go, woe is, and then she stopped herself and said, nope. I am still important, I'm still valuable, I'm still essential, I'm still necessary. It's like we really, really don't understand the lifeblood of the eyes, the humanity. And those who had like Lou Gehrig's disease where really all you're getting is the eyes. And the eyes will show pain and they'll show joy and they'll show all of the things. But how do we get away from valuing this. So let's talk a little bit about intersectionality um, and our various uh, identities. Let, let me just have you do an analysis of your um, identities and either make a mental note of these or jot them down. So I kind of went through some of these. In terms of uh, gender, we know the history in this country is that men are more highly valued than women. Uh, I remember very much my 95-year-old grandmother being born into this world and this country without the right to vote. Not because she was black, but because she was a woman. So think about what's your identity, and we're going to think about what's an identity that's privileged and what's an identity that's oppressed, so you can see your own intersectionality. Okay, so that's uh, gender. So race, we know that white is the privileged race in this country, in this context, and those who are not white are the oppressed identity. Um, I mentioned religion. The Christian roots of this country make Christian the privileged race, I mean, a religion, and other faiths the oppressed. Let me see. I've done. I keep I'm doing some of mine. So. Oh, good, good, good. Um, let's talk about, uh, ooh, let's talk about age. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the ability to still create children, right? Mm. There's something about still being childbearing age. Childbearing age, yeah. There's a clear age where, ironically, you get devalued because you're old or you're not, whatever. There's actually uh, a legal age in this country at which you can file an age discrimination suit. 
I remember that age right off the top of my head. But we we do these demarcations, again, because valuing people, devaluing people. So what's your age? Are you feeling like you're at the privileged stage of the age continuum? Or at you at, are you at the uh, oppressed age? And inherent in that age continuum is things like childbearing or voting. Um, so there's age, and then there's also youth. So those different things. Um, even military service comes with a privileged identity and an oppressed identity. We kind of now say to everybody, thank you for your service, like without any thought. But when men and women came back having served in the Vietnam War, they had a very different experience than veterans who had served in World War II. So we, again, have these oppressed, oppressed versus privileged identities across all social constructions. Yeah. You have to be 40 plus years old for the, the age discrimination. Suit. Thank you. I knew it was, I knew it was what I would call young. <laughs> Are you sure? Can we fact check that? <laughs> so are you seeing yourself in different identities? I talk a lot about the work of Lillian Wald, who is considered the founder of community health nursing. And I talk about Lillian Wall because she had lots of social identities. She um, was from a wealthy family in upstate New York, but she was Jewish by heritage. She was a white woman. She was highly educated. But she had, there was something about her lived experience that made her, led her to serve uh, those living in the tenement housing of Harlem, New York. She says, there's a quote that I use where she says, what I saw showed me where my lot was cast. Mm -hmm. Like she's like, I go home to Rochester and I see everybody dancing around in the parks. And then I come back to Harlem and I see kids just trying to play on what she called was a crokinole board. I guess it's like checkers or something. In the midst of chaos, she says. But she allowed her eyes to see and value what was happening around her and decided to use her privilege to help folk without privilege and to let where she had experienced oppression shape her commitment to those who lived oppression. If you don't have any identity that you can think of that's oppressed, then I would invite you to build deep relationship with someone who has a, an identity that's oppressed. When I was teaching in the College of Nursing, we used to do a course um, in our um, sort of multiculturalism course. I don't even remember what we called it then. But we had a cross-cultural encounter. And I would say, go do something in a space where people's identities are very different than yours. Uh, if you grew up in a white Catholic church, go to a black Pentecostal church. Mm, that's different. Go to a gay bar if you are straight. Do something where you're keenly aware of your difference mm. so that you can perceive what's going on in the lives of others. Yeah. So we have some, uh, some other comments, right? So another identity is being an immigrant or not speaking the language. So I have to, you know, I could stay here with you all night, but these good people got to go home. I know, they got so to go. are there some um, <laughs> fine thoughts that you want to leave us with? There are. Um, click to the, um, I think, yeah, let me just see what's, uh, uh, let's click through there. So um, I'm going to leave you these to just reflect on, and then I want to just give you a closing quote. So... I want to challenge you on how can you cultivate the courage to respond? And we've all been stifled 
by fear. I can think of a number of times when I bit my tongue, literally. Don't do it. So how can you cultivate the courage? Um, and then I want us to just do a popcorn, one feeling word of where this dialogue and the video have left you. Just one feeling, no context, just let it land. And you can just call them out and we'll repeat them for you. Okay. And if you're in the chat, please just write in the chat a one feeling word, so. Sad. Sad. Challenged. Yeah. Empowered. Inspired. Educated. Educated. Exhausted. Exhausted. Exhausted here too. <laughs> Empathy. Empathy, reflective, empowered, informed, informed, encouraged to persist. Mm -hmm. So go to the last uh, slide for me. Ooh, hopeful, better, determined, yes, mm -hmm. heard, motivated. I love these words. Mm -hmm. Peace, angry, driven, mm -hmm. moved. So wherever you're landing, there's no wrong answer, no wrong feeling, but it is the acknowledgement and inclusion of the affective that drives change. And so let me just encourage you further. Remember the quote started out, I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their body, education and culture for their mind, dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. And Dr. King's quote, concludes by saying, and I believe what self-centered people, he said men, have torn down that people other-centered can build up. Mm. And I have the audacity to believe that y'all in this room and on this Zoom are the other-centered people that are gonna come together and source change and you'll be able to look back. I want all of us to be on a rocking chair somewhere because I have Southern roots and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren saying, wait, 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 you, have to, you just have to teach people that? I mean, I don't, I don't understand. I need them to just be incredulous that we ever had to do this work because we will have done it so well. So thank y'all. Um, I also want to say that Dr. Gilbert is so kind that she told me to bring some of the books, a book that I recently wrote that if y'all just want. The greatest compliment I've gotten from this book is two people told me, my father, I gave the book to your, my father, this was a white friend, and he read it and he said, oh, that's what we're talking about. I took the time to put all these words down to encourage you to help you when you bump your head on some intersectional thing to be able to say, oh, no, 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 that's expected, and to keep moving forward. Thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you, Marita, for having me. OK, some last things. I want to um, personally thank Dr. Kennedy, because y'all, she always says yes. And that's the test of friendship. <laughs> so thank you for always saying yes. Um, I want to thank you all for your, for your presence, your participation. I want to thank you for your openness, both in the room and virtually. Um, thank you for sharing with us, um, being candid and vulnerable. Sakaya is putting a link right now in the chat. And those of you who are here, there should be a QR code, which is behind me. Um, we need for you to scan this QR code and do the post survey so you can get your CE credits. We want to make sure that you receive credit for being with us tonight. I just want to say, you know, we talked about um, needing courage to, to have these conversations. And I think what I want to thank you all most for is having the will, right? Even if it's difficult showing up being here, um, sharing with each other, naming your experiences, um, naming the things that you've learned, 
or the things that still uh, confound you or confuse you. So I just want to thank you for that. For those of you that are in the room, Dr. Kennedy will meet you back there to take pictures. You can um, get a book and get it signed. Um, the rest of you, thank you so much. I'm hoping it's not still snowing. We'll hang out for a second if you still want to talk to us about some other things. Everyone else, good night. Thank you so much for being with us, and we will see you on March 12th and March 28th.